Okay. Um, so um, we're going to talk today uh, about assembling theory. We're really we're going to be talking about uh, an approach that we've taken uh, in a few places in press that we're working towards in a in a book. Uh, we're thinking about theory and practice and how how uh, they are uh, uh, emerged together. And um, we're going to work that through in the, this paper using all sorts of exciting uh, things. So we asked you to go to responseware.eu just before and put in uh, tag 17. And that is some online polling technology. So um, you should now on your phone or whatever device say, do you understand how to use this technology? And you can answer A, yes, or B, no. This is the little tester. And, oh, yeah. Hooray! So I'm, I'm, I'm afraid it doesn't work. I'm afraid we can't sort your technological problems in this uh, in this session. Yeah. But um, uh, yeah, I anticipate that at least ten percent of people will have said no for hilarity purposes. Shall we? Uh, shall we have a look? That looks oh, like yeah. go. Oh, go. oh no, oh, no. It hasn't worked. Because there's two PowerPoint versions open. Can you see it? Oh, you can see it. Yeah. Oh, hooray! You can see it. You'll have to feed back to them. Yeah. Not working. So, uh, uh, how many? So what percentage of people said no? Ten percent. That was my good, good guess. Cool. Okay. Well, I'm glad it all works on your devices. That's smashing. Okay. So now. Uh, we would like you to record your cake archaeologically. You've got four minutes. I'll start the timer. It's very important you work with a partner or small group. Okay. Okay. Well, we can get you to return to your response where. Software? Yeah, so if you were uh, recording your cake by touching it, you might need to wipe your hands a little bit. We've got more napkins. Does anyone need a napkin? No. I don't have my MVQ, uh, MVQ level two in um, food, ha food hygiene and handling, just to reassure you. Um, so um, uh, we're very impressed to see that very few people uh, uh, recorded that cake by tasting it. Yeah. But uh, you are now welcome to eat the cake whilst you're listening to it. that experience uh, going back to the response where so our question first question to you is uh, did you find there was oh, that's a very in a very annoying position let's move it quickly did you find that there was a difference of opinion in how to record your cake yes or not this time hooray so um, oh oh you're very diplomatic and uh, democratic <laughs> Everyone. So 73% uh, had harmony in how they recorded their cake. That's lovely. Uh, so now we want to ask you. Oh, yeah. oh, sorry. How did you resolve any differences in your recording technique? And your options are the other person seemed more experienced, so I agree with them. All right. Oh, okay. Let's have a look at uh, how you experienced this. Oh, oh, look how democratic you are. Seventeen percent of people didn't care enough to work. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, but we did have some people who caved into the experience. All right. So there was three types of cake. There was chocolate cake, red velvet cake, and Victoria's uh, Bath. We nearly only bought two. Good job we bought three. Do you wish you had the other one of the other types of cake? Okay. <laughs> We're bearing in mind your answers. Oh, this is totally anonymous. They are anonymous. It's completely anonymous. Oh, feel the love, people. Feel the love. Oh, not only are you democratic, but it's, there's a lot of love going on in the room. That's great. So, um, obviously, you were you were uh, were, were recording the cake, but did your mind? Were you thinking about other things when you were doing it? Oh, I was cheating. Okay. 
Okay. And um, our final question, is this a pointless gimmick? Uh, a, yes, but it's fun. B, yes, get on with the paper. C, no, this is clearly a pedagogically sound exercise from which I'm gaining a valuable learning experience. Or D, I'm too hungover to care. And if it's D, you did very well last night. <laughs> Well, let's see how you all feel. Oh, oh, thank you, 30 seconds. Oh, a fifth of the room is still hung over. <laughs> you need to have a fry out before the party so you'll be able or to. Or some more cake. Or yeah. some more cake. Okie doke. So, so, what is the point of all this? Although this is a practical exercise, we think, we hope, it exposes a range of theoretical themes. In terms of the differences of opinion in recording your cake, there might have been different issues going on there. Was it power relationships, gender, experience, class? All of these dynamics influence our um, experience of taking part in the exercise, although we were very pleased to see actually in this room there was uh, much more consensus than when we've done it for other audiences. And I expect had we given you a bit longer, had this been a half hour session, those differences uh, might have been... Yeah, you'd all have been inside. fighting about the recording methods and wishing we were working with someone else after, after yeah, the end of the Yeah, <laughs> guarantee it. Um, but we think it also shows that people bring with them preconceptions about how to do archaeological practice, about the right way to do something, the right way to record something, the right way to ex excavate, the right way to work with other people. We don't work in isolation, we bring these things with us. Um, and I think even when we're doing specific uh, focus exercise such as this, you're at once engaged with the task at hand, but you're also engaging with networks outside of the room, or at least 16% of you were um, through your social media or through your mind wandering with you know other things popping into your mind. Again, had it been a longer exercise, I think that would have been even more prominent about how we don't just come to an exercise, we, you, you're part of a distributed network. Cool. Oh, it's an excellent Oh, sorry. Um, and this is what we like to call learning assemblages. Um, this is a phrase that we've called, Karina and I. Yes, so. yes. Um, traditional modes of teaching and learning are known as banking, banking models, with a lecturer imparting their knowledge to the passive absorbing audience. Um, this has been cri critiqued by critical pedagogy and things such as the flipped classroom and in some of the great, um, uh, great examples we've already seen here today. Um, we've been thinking about this some more and I'd uh, like to take this one step further by thinking about the wider <coughs> assemblages of which we're part, including the way that materials impact on the learning process. Before we do that, we're going to think about um, what we mean by the broader concept of assemblages using assemblage theory. Uh, so, um, we've both been really influenced by assemblages, new materialist relational approaches in our uh, teaching and learning. Obviously, everyone in here is uh, in here because of theory, and it's the big theory, hot theory thing right now. Um, but just to explain what we're talking about is the idea that people and things are always entwined and continually emerge through their relationships with one another. <coughs> and then in, in, the early in, in the earlier papers, um, it, was, it was noted that one of the most useful ways of, of understanding theory is to use it through real world context. So we want to use a real world example, uh, which is uh, Rachel Crellin's example of a bus. Um, so, um, so, Rachel says, just get to read it. Uh, so, Rachel says, uh, we might consider the assemblage of a bus travelling between towns. The assemblage is made up of varied kinds of passengers, old and young, all going to different places to carry out different things. The bus driver, who has a different agenda, is also part of the assemblage, as is the road network, the money used to pay the fare, the seats and the windows, the motor engine, and the bus operating company. All of these components are brought together in a temporary assemblage that is the number one bus on an afternoon in July. And she goes on to talk about how as the bus moves, the assemblage changes, so people might get on and off. Me and Karina like the idea that the exhaust might fall off, although Rachel doesn't give that, but we quite like the idea that that might be a whole new assemblage of traffic, police officers and all sorts of things. Um, and so assemblages are always temporary, and any component can at once be part of numerous different assemblages. And, um, and larger assemblages, uh, like the bus network, there it is, um, 
uh, uh, emerge from the component parts of smaller assemblages. There's a whiz through of it, and if you want to know more, read Rachel's excellent paper in Cambridge Archaeological Journal, 2017. But there we go. That's, uh, that's, the, that's, that's the kind of uh, idea that we find really useful for thinking about pedagogy. Um, oh, in fact, I've gone off script. Uh, where am I talking from? Yeah. Ace. So the insights that we get from our uh, cake exercise here are equally as explicit when you consider the, the, the learning uh, assemblages of the field and the classroom. So learning isn't a linear, linear process. As you saw with your cakes, you were debating, you were discussing, you were bringing stuff from elsewhere. And thinking uh, about uh, pedagogy in terms of assemblages re reminds us uh, about the distributed agency in assemblages. So the, the learning experience isn't just comprised of you learning stuff, us teaching you stuff, you learning stuff, that kind of thing. It emerges from also the material things that you engage with, the cake and the ruler and the desk, all of those are part of that, uh, that learning assemblage. So traditional methods might separate, separate out teaching theory from teaching other types of archaeology and from doing archaeology and practical archaeology and research. And we uh, take this approach to point out that that's a, a false separation. And that, oh golly me, we've only got five minutes, yikes. Um, um, that uh, what's alienating about, uh, 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 about uh, the, the, the falsely separating it out is what's alienating about archaeological theory. So if we take an assemblage approach to teaching and learning, we can see how theory and practice and all other areas of archaeological discourse are connected, how they're emergent, and how the wider assemblages that students bring to the learning assemblage inform their learning experience. Yeah. Um, so thinking this through through the different uh, assemblages that we encounter, we can think about the assemblage of a lecture theatre. Um, we can think about how the architecture of the space um, reinforces the traditional um, hierarchies, the uh, differences between students and lecturers. Um, we can think about how the clock is situated at the back of the room, so only the lecturer can see it, not you. It would be much benefit to you if it stopped. Um, <laughs> but we've got those power dynamics. We can think about the, um, the mugs of coffee that might be keeping you awake, that might also spill and cause a distraction. The material components of the um, lecture theatre are in, of our environment are impacting our learning experiences, both as a lecturer and as students. We can think about your devices, your mobile phones, your laptops, that you might be checking out a fact, but you might also be texting someone to see what we're doing after the lecture or where the, the best pub is for afterwards. Your handouts, which might be um, there to uh, give you reminders, might also be causing a bit of a distraction. All these material aspects interact um, with the learning experience. And we come to this room with all of our different experiences, with our knowledges and skills, uh, including the experiences of the field and the fieldwork assemblage. So thinking about being in the field, we can think about the materiality of the training, of the excavation trench, for instance, how the tape um, dissects a trench and it causes you to physically navigate it, how the buckets um, tr uh, might get, but get in the way as you have to tread over them. Um, the um, experience that the, we bring as supervisors, as excavators, again, not isolating us out as um, just in the, you're not just present in the field, but the, um, the whole assemblage of your life that you bring. Uh, Delando, when talking about assemblage theory, uh, coins, uh, uses a term that it's more than a sum of the parts. <coughs> and we can think about this nicely with the excavation trench. If you just have a, a trowel or a person or a field that doesn't make an excavation, it requires the excavator with the skills, the knowledge and the experience with the trail at the excavation site to create that assemblage, to create more than the sum of its parts. And think about those material and um, social components that create the, the assemblage. Um, and the, what was I going to say next? <laughs> Sorry, I skipped on the slides by Oh, no, that's okay. Um, and we um, bring with us both field in, um, work assemblages and experiences come back with us into the lecture theatre. They're not separated out, they're integral to our learning experiences. Not just um, the archaeological theory lecture theatre, but any archaeological lecture. Over to your next point, I think.
So, to conclude, um, it's really tempting to have a kind of simple view in which we, we decide students hate theory. But in reality, we argue that it's the compartmentalisation or the black boxing of theory away from the rest of our other archaeological practices and research and discourses, which is alienating for students. And what we've shown with the cake exercise, with the response where, uh, is that taking an assemblage approach, and in our just uh, generic examples of field and classroom, is that taking an assemblage approach undercuts this kind of alienation of theory from everything else. And at the same time, it emphasises how <coughs> students are active in the learning process and how practitioners actively theorise theorize the past, whether they acknowledge it or not. So taking an assemblage approach breaks down these kind of false barriers uh, in our teaching and learning, and it enables our teaching and our research and our practice to be more encompassing and empowering, and, de and, and it and allow allows us to create a more democratic uh, learning, uh, teaching and research. And so if you take this kind of approach, you could argue that theory is a piece of cake. <laughs> <laughs>